an opportunity. This was originally planned uh, as a session uh, with two remarkable artists. Sure. Two remarkable artists uh, who'd worked in and about the politics of the Islamic world. Uh, Molly Crabapple, who was able to make it, uh, but also uh, Shazia Sekunda, who sadly went down with an attack of E. coli um, and is in a hospital in New York, sadly, today. So um, we're going to miss Shazia very much, but it does give us more time uh, to concentrate on the incredible story that Molly has to tell, uh, or the rather many remarkable stories which Molly has, has told herself and uh, uh, which she has brought out with her remarkably wide-ranging work. And Molly is extraordinary not just for what she writes about, uh, and what she covers, but the um, ambidextrous, if that's the right way uh, of describing it, uh, a method that she has uh, uh, mastered and, and championed. Most of us are given uh, one gift, if we're lucky, uh, to, which we can take to the world and, uh, uh, and, and make careers and, and lives out of. Um, Molly has two. She is both a fantastic artist. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, she's both a fantastic artist with this uh, extraordinary uh, sort of Goya-esque punk style. Um, and, uh, uh, but also uh, latterly has, uh, has, has uh, spent more and more time uh, with words as well as images. Uh, and since 2013 has turned herself into a remarkable uh, journalist uh, and writer as well as an artist. What unites her career, I think, throughout all the different phases it's taken, and it's taken some pretty wide-ranging loops and meanders at its times, uh, from covering burlesque dancers and sex workers and the New York nightlife through to the Islamists of Raqqa, is probably as wide an uh, ambience as you could possibly uh, uh, cross, uh, uh, a real uh, Euphrates of, uh, of differences. Um, but what unites it, I think, is, is, is the fact that she is drawn to the marginal, to the marginalized, uh, to those uh, on the edge of things, people who've been shoved to the edge uh, and who've survived um, and prospered and flourished despite all that fate has thrown against them. Is that true? Am I making that up? Or? No, you're not making that up at all. That's, thank you. That's <laughs> quite perceptive. <laughs> so we'll go chronologically through Molly's Rife, um, because I think it's the only way, in a sense, that one can make sense of this uh, extraordinary, uh, wide-ranging uh, subject matter that she has covered in the different phases of her career. So a little bit about this restless childhood. New York, mixed parentage, Puerto Rican, Jewish. Talk a little about, about the background. My God. Well, so I suppose it's a bit cliche, but I might start uh, by either thanking or blaming my parents for my rebellious nature. My, my father is, um, he's a Puerto Rican um, Marxist academic who uh, raised me to always question empire and challenge authority. When I was a little girl, he said, I, got two rule, I have two rules for you. Question authority and be interesting. <laughs> uh, my mother is a, a wonderful artist in her own right who um, she's, um, we come from a family of um, Belarusian uh, Jews who, uh, well, my great-grandfather was even in an anti-Zionist communist revolutionary Jewish party back in the old country um, <laughs> called the Bund. And my mother is a wonderful artist who draws perhaps like I would if I was a better person and my heart wasn't so black inside. <laughs> and I, while I dropped out of university, I learned so much uh, sort of sitting at her feet and having her tell me no, 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 that's not how you draw a sky. No, a nose doesn't look like an upside down seven. For God's sakes, look at something. And um, I uh, grew up as a terrible student. I, as I said, I dropped out of school. But perhaps one of my most formative things was that I had the luck and the intense privilege to be able to, when I was 17, spend uh, six months uh, traveling around alone with very, very little money around Europe and uh, also Morocco. And Morocco, um, that was the first place where I had encountered the Islamic world. It was the place that planted in me my love of the Arabic language, my uh, love of the intensely intellectual, intensely detailed and sensuous um, 
or an intensely ornamental and refined uh, architecture and aesthetic of the Islamic world. And perhaps it's the place that, through all sorts of meandering threads, drew me here. And this is 2003, so this is two years after 9-11, when uh, mm. Islam and the Islamic... No, 2001, I was there. 2001, you were there. Yeah, 2001. So this is a, at a moment when suddenly the Islamic world has moved from the periphery of the American consciousness into something which is um, everyone has suddenly ha had to explore and, and, and discover. And did that timing impact on that initial journey, age 17? So the first time I went to Morocco, it was actually uh, two months before September 11th. Um, and so it was perhaps the last moment that you could go before all of stuff. the post 9-11 uh, hysteria and the um, intense violence that America inflicted on the world colored how uh, we were seen in the Islamic world, or at least colored it to such an extent. But um, I went back after. I went uh, both to Turkey uh, when I was 18. I, I was obsessed with a mosque on um, a sort of a mosque palace ruined complex called uh, Ishak Pasha Sarai. In Dubai is it? <laughs> in Dubai is it? Right, uh, right on the border of Armenia and Iran, and um, in the shadow of Mount Ararat. Exactly, uh, exactly. And I went there, and it was terribly restored. It taught me something about uh, chasing <laughs> ghosts. <laughs> Um, so this, so just to give some geography here, so this is right on the on the furthest edge of Turkey. If you head uh, as far east as you possibly can, right across uh, Anatolia, uh, this is the last stop before the Iranian border, and, and all the Iranians are busy getting back into their burkas uh, uh, and sort of putting on their putting on their veils and things, ready to go home uh, as as this happens. So so this gave you a taste, um, but then you went in the sense that that bit of your life was shelved for a bit and you went back and you became the uh, the goyer of the new york of the new york uh, nightlife talk a little bit i know you don't want to talk about much of this and, and focus more on the middle east but it's still it's it's a lot of fun so, so um when i when i came back to new york I, I had to work i am not a lady of leisure by background unfortunately and i um worked as a naked model uh, when i was back in new york and a burlesque dancer because i was unfit for conventional employment as a shop girl or whatever else I should have been doing. And I worked both uh, sort of dancing and performing and posing, but also uh, chronicling the talent and toughness and grit of all the other women I knew who did that. Um, and soon, because I, I lack talent as a performer, I segued into an artist that covered that world. I would sit in nightclubs in the corner with my sketchbook, like squinting in the dark, trying to draw as fast as I could as my friends like ate fire on stage or did backflips. Um, and this period of her life is chronically beautifully in uh, Drawing Blood, uh, her memoir published four years ago. Four um, years, no, three, three years ago, dear God, 2015. I wish we had, could project some of the images, but uh, fantastic uh, moments, sketches from these moments in nightclubs, um, burlesque dancers putting on wigs, uh, uh, strapping on uh, uh, their kit. Uh, and um, how, how long, I mean, the, the, the art bit of it was amusement, or were you selling your pictures, or having exhibitions, or? Well, I was, I was trying to have exhibitions. I had no, I've, I mean, now I do, I guess, but for most of my career, I had no access to the gallery world. I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know how to talk. It all seemed like people speaking in this, intensely boring but complex babble would be how I put it <laughs> and um, putting a lot of and selling I don't know tin foil to Russian oligarchs for millions of dollars I didn't terribly understand it so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good job if you can get it it's a, it's a nice job <laughs> if you can get it but I, I clearly could not so um, I was like trying to exhibit my work in like you know warehouse parties and cafes and um, you know, clubs and stuff I had many comical experiences which you can read about in this book if you like to hear about young, ambitious people and their failures. <laughs> but um, I also, uh, I was making some of my living as an illustrator. And doing murals of, of these girls. And doing murals, yes, I, I did murals. If any of you have uh, been to London, uh, there's a nightclub called The Box uh, in, in London. It's also in New York. And I painted my friends all over the walls. And by that time, I was about, I guess I was 24 when I started working at The Box. And I, I loved it because the people in the audience were the worst people in the world. They were all of the like, you know, oligarchs and, and bankers and hedge fund bros, all the people that destroyed everything, that wrecked our economy. And um, they, were, they were so poor seen. And my friends were allowed to completely abuse them on stage because that was the sort of dynamic. It was like a dominatrix or class war in the form of a club. 
And so I convinced the owner to allow me to draw the people there as pigs snorting cocaine. <laughs> and I covered the walls of this nightclub in London with my friends as gods and goddesses surrounded by pigs. <laughs> And um, the, the whole sex work, a bit of your uh, of your work. I mean, it's a different world, obviously, from nightclubs and burlesque. Where, how did you get your your way into that world? Well, so at that time when I was, you know, nineteen, twenty, there was this sort of I don't know I don't want to call it a scene a scam. I don't know a way to get. Basically, um, there were, there are these guys that they. We called them guys with cameras. They wanted to take photos of you, but it wasn't something where the photo was the end result, would be how I'd put it, because they like weren't good enough. It was more that they wanted a naked girl with them in their hotel room. And uh, the camera was an excuse. The camera allowed them to imagine that they weren't hiring, essentially, a stripper. And so that was what I did. That was how I funded my art career. Um, I would not be here uh, writing fancy books or uh, you know, having my work in museums if I hadn't had... A, the option to uh, to do this and to get paid a hundred dollars an hour for it, um, but because of that, um, which is kind of a you know peripheral aspect of of that world, I uh, have many friends and you know had and have many friends who were dominatrixes or escorts um, or strippers. And at that time, there was a lot of political organizing around it and uh, media making. We even had our own uh, magazine uh, that a woman named Audacia Ray made called Spread. That was devoted to uh, sex workers telling their own stories and not having uh, this myth propagated that they were voiceless. And, and what were you doing? You were drawing them? You were, uh, I mean, did you have any wider plan to, to, to create uh, books or, or magazine articles out of this, or was it...? Well, I wrote about this yeah. um, in, my, in my book, uh, Drawing Blood, and also I, I did a lot of journalism later about that world, um, especially, I mean, I even did investigations into these, uh, they call them special prostitution courts in New York, where... Um, our incredibly abusive and rapey uh, New York City policemen would arrest sex workers, haul them in front of the court, and then the judge would say, aren't you grateful you're here? We saved you. Um, you know, after they might have been beaten or extorted or even, you know, raped by these police. So I, I did a lot of investigations about that, and I think that I had um, insight... For, into, for New York Times? For, 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 Vice, for Vice. I did, for Vice. And I think I had insight into that because um, I had uh, been involved in this sort of organizing, and I had been involved in this sort of scene uh, since the time I was 20. So in 2012, you're arrested, and that brings your career into a new uh, phase because you begin writing at this point. Talk about that. I was arrested uh, during the a protest for the one-year anniversary of Occupy Wall Street, which was a movement that I had been uh, quite involved in. And uh, I was not arrested because of any act of courage whatsoever. I was standing on the sidewalk like a coward. A policeman uh, thought that I was looked short and non-threatening and pulled me into the middle of the street and... Um, you know, slapped some cuffs on me for blocking traffic. And it wasn't like a terrible arrest. I had a lot of friends who were, you know, beaten up pretty badly or even had permanent injuries from their arrests, but I certainly was never touched. But um, I was so angry at the blitheness with which Americans take arrests um, and with which the way that so many, especially like white middle-class Americans think it's just okay that like black and brown people are just arrested for whatever. They don't realize what trauma it is. They don't realize that it's essentially like a kidnapping. And so I, I wrote about uh, my own arrest. Um, and the reason I didn't just draw about it is that words can be explicit in a way that art uh, very often cannot be, right? I didn't want to whisper about it and hint. I wanted to scream and you know, raise some noise. And so I wrote this piece for CNN. It was, my, I think, one of my first published pieces ever. Certainly, I think of it as my first real you know, published piece. And I, uh, a lot of people read it and spoke about it. And after that, I got an offer from Vice to write more for them. And since then, I mean, since then, my work, both essays and journalistic work, has taken me all over the world. And, and this was pure words? There was, no, there was no illustration to go with this stuff? There are, like a few, there are a few illustrations to go with it. I've always had a few illustrations. Maybe because I didn't have a name as a writer, but I did have a name as an artist. My illustrations were my bribe to get it into places. But also, I mean, I, I've been drawing since I was four, right? This is my native language. Is, yeah. Is lines and is lines and colors, and so it would be odd to me, to perhaps, just to write. Even, but um, maybe I will someday. Um, and so then, a, a serious departure and, and a, and a, and a uh, forerunner of, of what, what is to come. You go off and, and you cover Guantanamo Bay. Talk about that. What was what was that like? Well, a place uh, most of us have only read about and, and seen on TV. When, well, Guantanamo Bay, I, when I was trying to describe it, I, I described it as a place where 
there was no irony. It's a world famous torture camp that uh, nearly 800 Muslims have passed through. Um, only, I want to say seven of which have been like even convicted of anything. Um, it's a place where uh, force feeding uh, was being done while I was there to a large percentage of the uh, detained men. But it's also a place whose slogan is honor bound to defend freedom. It's Work makes free. Yeah. yeah, work makes, yeah, it's, they have a gift shop uh, where they sell Guantanamo Bay little princess t-shirts with all of the lack of self-awareness it might take to sell dirndls at Buchenwald's. Uh, um, and it's the place where the American inability to be good goes right up against the American talent for being nice. Go, go on. <laughs> well, which is that you have, I mean, the most terrible things being done. I mean, this is a place that institutionalized torture. Um, this is where the waterboarding took place. And, yeah. I mean, the waterboarding would be probably be the least of it. I mean, it was a place where, I mean, people were large harpers in an investigation proved that some guys were perhaps tortured to death there. I mean, it's... What sort of methods? Beating? Um, shoving rags into their throats. Uh, it also, you know, is a place that used um, like rape as a method of torture. I mean, it was it's it's sickening what was was done there, right? But you would have, um, as a member of the media that was going there, you would have all of these uh, facts presented to you by these like, you know, sweet, big, smile, wholesome, you know, all American, um, you know, pr military press officers or or members of the military with just the sort of blithe uh, disregard for uh, what they were upholding. And that, I mean, did you, was it quite an easy thing to be a reporter coming in and actually trying to cover this? I mean, was there a, a method by which you can just apply to, to go and draw and, and report on Guantanamo Bay and they take you in and you get a, you get a PR pack? Uh, indeed, yeah, you, they have press junkets to Guantanamo. Um, I was not particularly uh, well known then. I had just kind of started writing and this was one of my first journalistic pieces. So I didn't really raise any particular red flags for them. Uh, I think that often I've been able to go into places because artists are seen as kind of uh, flaky and non-threatening and perhaps not very bright. Uh, so, you know, they wasn't seen as a potential troublemaker. And um, yeah, people would apply. There, there were journalists from tons of media outlets there, um, mostly European uh, when I was there. And yeah, they have a tour. Uh, one of the most disturbing things that they do is, the first time I went, I was there for the 9-11 uh, pretrial hearings, uh, which is the, um, the hearings for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and um, the 9-11 co-conspirators. And before uh, you go into this heavily censored courtroom, they have you do a press conference where you speak to the relatives of people who were murdered on 9-11. And they tell you things like, uh, you know, identifying their father by his titanium hip. And so how, how long were you allowed to, to go to, and, and what were you allowed to see in Guantanamo Bay? What was the... Oh, it's a Potemkin tour. You're n I was only allowed to see the prisoners for seven minutes uh, through... Um, what do you call it, like a double-sided mirror, you know? Right, where right. And the reason for that is that uh, the, the men who are detained in Guantanamo will protest, as quite rightly they should, if media is there. And they'll denounce their conditions, and Guantanamo is very concerned about that because they are uh, still propagating a myth that people are perfectly happy to be there. So you were observing them, yes. but they couldn't see you. Exactly. And so only you couldn't interact with them at all? Uh, no. no, no, and only for seven minutes. Um, I profiled... Um, someone who was a young man when he was uh, taken, uh, who was released after 14 years, and I corresponded with him a bit after he was allowed out. And it's soon after this that you returned for the first time since this 17-year-old trip to Morocco. You returned to the Middle East, this time to cover the Syrian civil war out of Tripoli. Yes, I, I did a piece for uh, the New York Times about uh, Syrian refugees in Tripoli in uh, Lebanon, not, in, not the more famous Libyan city. Uh, it's uh, the city in Lebanon at that time, it had these two neighborhoods that um, had been involved in a sectarian sort of civil war on a mini scale against each other for the last 30 years. Um, and uh, Syrians were fleeing uh, to the city and finding themselves again, you know, surrounded by snipers and, you know, people with RPGs and again in uh, this atmosphere of violence. Uh, I, so I, I just interviewed people there. It was, it was very, very green still, um, but 
it uh, gave me a um, hunger to write and uh, investigate and learn more about uh, the Syrian war, in part because I, um, when I on that same trip, I also I spent some time um, meeting uh, refugees that were living in these makeshift camps in Lebanon's Beka Valley, and I met um, some of the toughest, most resilient women that I've ever met in my life. And um, I remember I met an old woman who um, her husband had lost his legs to uh, diabetes. He didn't have a I guess he wasn't able to get treatment for it, so he'd lost his legs um, during the war. And, there, and she was living with her whole family in this shell of a building. And uh, she had been a field nurse uh, for, um, who had treated rebel fighters, and she had some, been someone who had marched in protests against the Assad regime. And um, there, you know, she had some kids that were jailed, that were missing. She didn't know what happened to them. And there she was there, and I just remember sitting with her, um, having tea, and thinking about how the world had utterly betrayed uh, these people, and so I kept writing about them. And soon after that, you go to a, another sort of concentration camp. You go to Gaza. Talk, uh, talk about your experience there. And, and, and you come from a, a partly Jewish background, but an anti-Zionist Jewish background. So, well, so Historically, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I would say so, my great-grandfather, yes. <laughs> so, so talk about what it felt like that, uh, t to, be in, to be in Gaza, um, and, and to see... Uh, this, is the time, this is soon after the... What, what a year, it was like exactly yeah. a year after. So uh, there's one thing that I always want to stress when I want to speak um, about uh, Jews and Israel. Uh, I'm Jewish. My mother is Jewish. I'm you know, very proud of that heritage. And I think it's fundamentally wrong, and it's a fallacy that's done by many people, including um, notably Israel itself, to conflate uh, Jews with Israel and to um, act like this um, state that is you know, founded on apartheid has a sort of a collective ownership over us, even though we might not even, we, you know, we're not even citizens of it, right? We have nothing to do with it. So um, it wasn't that I felt like guilty as a Jew for Gaza because I have, I am not Israeli. I have nothing in my family is Israeli. It's another country. I wouldn't feel any more guilty for it than I would feel guilty for Saudi Arabia. But as a human, as a human, and perhaps as an American paying taxes, I was... And as someone who could claim Israeli citizenship if you wanted to. Lots of people can claim Irish citizenship <laughs> too in America. Um, as a human and as an American who pays taxes and thus who is paying, you know, and sells weapons to Israel, I, pers I think that that would be where uh, my, uh, any guilt that I had would come from. But Gaza is an incredibly small, claustrophobic place that is uh, presided over by Israeli drones and that Israel bombs and shells and shoots and invades um, seemingly at whim, sometimes even uh, just to test weapons that it will sell to authoritarian regimes later. Uh, when I was there, uh, they, there was an anti-Hamas kind of like ultra-Islamist group that um, shot some ineffectual uh, tin pipes over uh, onto a field in Israel, and Israel responded by uh, shelling when, when I was there. Um, I went to Shujaia, which was a neighborhood that Israel um, destroyed. They completely destroyed it, and it was a level of destruction. I, I don't mean like a little destruction. I mean that they went in, they bombed, then they brought in tanks, and they shot holes in uh, buildings, and then they brought in bulldozers. And people were living in uh, the shells of their houses, um, Gaza, of course, is under a blockade. It's you know, been besieged for, um, well, since um, Hamas was um, elected. And because of that, there's never enough construction materials. And, and one of the things that uh, stuck with me was I was, um, I drew a, it was a building that had been you know, completely bombed. And when a building is bombed, I'm not sure, I'm sure you guys have seen like what rebar looks like after a bombing, how it's all like twisted and convoluted and it looks like snakes, you know? It's very evil looking material. And uh, there were guys, uh, young, you know, Gazan guys that were taking this rebar and they were straightening it. With like, literally they were like banging it back into shape with like, you know, rocks and quite primitive tools. And I was like, if I had something that just shows how tough these people are and how and what that, that sort of defiance that you will not break us you even if you have all of the weapons and all of the drones and all of the bombs and all of the soldiers you won't break us 
it would be those young guys uh, straightening rebar on that boiling hot day in Gaza. But to put the counter case, the, the, the Israeli case, the, the, the uh, Hamas has not accepted the, the uh, uh, creation of Israel. Uh, it, has, it is a charter which is dedicated to Israel's destruction. Uh, and it would destroy Israel if it could. So therefore, Israel has a justification for using extreme tactics on a organization which, if it had the power, potentially would destroy Israel. I don't believe in targeting civilians, no matter uh, what regime is ruling them. I don't believe in besieging civilians um, or bombing hospitals or not allowing uh, children out for cancer treatment or um, destroying art centers or any of the other many, many things that Israel has done uh, to Gaza. And um, I would feel the same no matter who was um, ruling uh, Gaza. I think there is no excuse for targeting civilians. Um, where were you writing this for? I wrote that one for Vice. And, and what was the reception? Did you, did you ha get hostility? I mean, it's one thing in a sense to write about Guantanamo Bay where you have most of liberal America behind you. Um, but Gaza is something which obviously raises many more heckles and, and puts you on one particular side of a very bitter divide. Um, yes, I, I did. Uh, I, I did get a lot of a lot of flack for that. I mean, as a journalist, you, you get flack for everything. Mo the most bitter flack I've gotten in my life was for writing about Syria. But um, more at, bitter than more bitter. Than oh, that. definitely by far. Why? Um, I think because, well, I think because you know. I mean, Israel pays trolls, but so does Russia. Um, I don't know why it's more bitter, but definitely is. I, I, I got one-tenth of the hatred that for writing about uh, Gaza than I have for writing about Syria. So we're going to head on to Syria now. So it's around this time, you've come out of Gaza, you've, you've done Guantanamo Bay, and you meet, or you, for, the, for the first time, this guy that you've been chatting to online, Marwan, uh, who is from, uh, from Raqqa, from ISIS-occupied uh, edge of Syria, uh, on, the, on, the, on the Iraqi, on the Persian and Iraqi borders of Syria. Um, tell me about how you got into contact with him and your initial uh, work with him. Well, after, um, after I did that piece on Lebanon, I kept you know, writing about Syria. And at that time, there was a small community on Twitter of people that would talk about it. Uh, some, of the, some of us were analysts, uh, some journalists. Some were just like nerds. Um, but a lot of them were, you know, were Syrians. And there was this one guy who said on his bio that he was inside Raqqa, which at the time was occupied by ISIS. And I was like, what the hell? That can't be true, you know, that's impossible. And so I, I started uh, speaking to um, this, um, this young man, uh, Marwan Hisham. And I realized that first, no, he absolutely was in Raqqa. And second of all, that um, he was one of the most uh, brilliant and independent-minded people that I had ever had the privilege to speak with. Yeah, he was an English literature graduate who um, had gone back home, found his hometown invaded, and was um, sneaking uh, surreptitious news to the Western press at risk of being um, you know, beheaded. And we uh, very quickly, we became friends online. At, at first... Um, Again, just give a little picture. So, so Raqqa is now is, is, is the main uh, ISIS headquarters yeah, yeah, the, the, inside the, Syria. Yeah, the capital of the, the caliphate, yeah. But it's actually a back-end nowhere town in the middle of nowhere. It's like the kind of, like, kind of scuzziest fly bone. I wouldn't know. That's a little bit harsh. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, um, it's a more... Uh, it's, it's not a Aleppo. Yeah. Well, it's a more like conservative rural town. Uh, Marwan's family were... Um, you know, they had worked as farmers, um, though it was Harun al-Rashid's summer capital as well. And, you know, it had had some, um, some days of glory during the Abbasid era, but, you know, had sort of, now was kind of, it was kind of a backwater, I would say. Um, but so... And how is he communicating? He's in an uh, internet cafe? He's at no, home no, on they, his had, they, had in, they had internet, they had internet there. Um, basically, as soon as they kicked the regime out of these areas, uh, entrepreneurs smuggled over satellite dishes from Turkey and then just started s putting up repeaters and selling Wi-Fi. So he's, he's actually chatting like anyone else. He's in his bedroom. Absol absolutely, and yeah. And he's not being monitored. It's, it's, yeah, it's possible no. to... Yeah. No, the ISIS monitoring of the internet was more like they eventually shut off all the private internet, then you'd be at a cafe, and then some ISIS thug would come up to you, take your phone out of your hand, and I then see. be like, what's on it here? Oh, I see. So, but he was, it, he was nonetheless risking his life by communicating with you. No, he would have been risking his life if he had somehow got... Like, if, if, you know, if, if he had gotten caught for doing it, which there are a million ways, obviously, but... Um, and at this time, there are, there, are, there are guys being hung on street corners in Raqqa. Exactly, and, yeah, yeah. And there, are, there are the heads and the, you know, the crucified bodies. I mean, it was horrific. And um, 
he re- he was absolutely risking. He was risking everything to speak to me. So uh, you start by doing a couple of Vanity Fair articles with him. We do. Yeah. So this was something extraordinary. I um, this is probably the most extraordinary artistic collaboration of my my life. Um, I asked Marwan if he had photos of Raqqa, and I was thinking, like, you know how we all have photos, right? That we have of our hometown, maybe even a bit old, you know, on our phones. And I was like, do you have any photos I could draw from? And he's like, no, but I'll, I'll take some from me, for you. And that was, I mean, this guy is just probably the bravest journalist I've ever met, you know, to do that. He went all around Raqqa, surreptitiously taking photos of scenes that he had specifically planned um, to puncture ISIS propaganda. Uh, for instance, um, kids digging through the trash for stuff to sell or bread lines. Um, but also scenes that showed Raqqa as um, an actual city, right? You know, this is his hometown. It's, it's his hometown that's being occupied. It's not like, you know, magical, bombed out place of dudes in like black ski masks. It's actually, you know, a place where c- civilians live. Uh, three million civilians, I believe. Where he's been a teenager. Where he's exactly, where, where he grew up, you know, where he like, you know, smoked cigarettes and hid from, hid from his dad and played soccer, you know? And so uh, he sent me these photos and I drew from them. And when I got those photos, it was like looking through someone else's eyes, you know, past all of the borders, past all of the laws, just like, you know, seeing through someone else's eyes. And he, uh, he wrote captions to accompany them, uh, kind of, you know, like, almost like a tour. And your first collaborations with him, you did without actually meeting him. He's in Raqqa, yes. you're in New York. Yes. Or, yeah. Yeah, the first, the first and second collaborations, because we repeated this from Mosul, which was also under ISIS occupation. And um, in fact, even our third collaboration, which he drew um, in East Aleppo, in Re- which was held by rebels at the time. And um, people loved these, and also um, we loved working together. Out of interest, I mean, economics, presumably he's, having, he's hard up like anyone else in Raqqa. Yeah. Were you able to get money to him? Uh, we you, sent money you, to his family. Yeah. He had family in that, Turkey. Yeah. And, um, so this is work, genuine collaboration work. I- exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah no, it's paid too. Yeah, yeah. no, it's fifty-fifty. You know, and um, yeah, we just Western Union money to like a family member that had ID. Right. Right. Um, and then after this, I um, I was like, you know, we should do a book together. You know, and we can like co-write it. And this is the uh, point you have to hold this up. Yeah. <laughs> Brothers of the Gun. We we should do a book together, and. Um, you know, I'll, I'll illustrate it, um, but it won't just be from photos you take, because we can't do that. It'll also be from your memories, you know? And um, we can, you know, write it together as, as equal partners, and um, you can, like, art direct all the art to make sure it's good, and we'll make something great. And um, that, doing that, took up the next um, three years of my life. And um, So you then meet him for the first time in Istanbul. I did, yeah. He... Um, he uh, was able to um, cross the border into to Turkey. Get, I mean, that is no easy thing in itself. Getting no. out of Raqqa, getting over the border, all these are things where he's taking, each stage he's taking Each his stage, life. each stage he was yeah. risking his life, um, either from ISIS or from Turkish border guards, quite frankly, who have been shooting uh, refugees for um, some years now. And so, you know, I'm, I was so honored, you know, that he, that he chose to do this with me. Um, and it was very much his choice. He could have, you know, done the book with another journalist. Many would have liked to, or he could have done it alone. But um, the fact that he believed in me and that he trusted our collaboration is perhaps something that I'm, I mean, I'm so greatly honored by. And we spent the next two years, uh, next three years, actually, uh, working on it um, in Istanbul. I would come. I would come. I went. I went over ten times. I'm a little. It all kind of blurs together. So. And, and the storyline of the book, as it developed, is, is the story of, of two brothers, two friends? It's the story of his two uh, best friends when he was growing up. Uh, one of them was a Niall, who was an art student and, like, the prototypical, like, kind of charming bad boy that everyone wants to be. Like, you know, the guy that, like, knows how to talk to girls and, like, you know, counterfeits money for cigarettes and, um, you know, everyone thinks is, like, super cool. And uh, Niall uh, was... Um, uh, during uh, one of the early protests uh, that you know in the revolution, he uh, was arrested and he witnessed uh, torture, especially torture that was extremely. Um, it was based on religious humiliation. Um, you know, like they would force people to like pray to Bashar al-Assad and you know say like, "Who's your God? Bashar is your your God." And um, he was so horrified by what he had seen uh, that he gave up on the idea of peaceful protest. Um, 
which was an idea that Marwan has always and still believes in. And he instead became a, he joined a rebel group. And so in, initially, mm. he's he's in a sort of democratic resistance to the Assad regime. It, well, yeah. all of these were democratic, but he was in a yeah. peaceful resistance peaceful. to the Assad re regime. But then he he joined an armed an armed rebel group. An armed Islamist group or an armed anti-Islamist group? Or at that time, it wasn't like that. It wasn't either of those. It was at the very beginning, and it was almost like armed group of local guys would okay. be how I'd put it. You know. Um, that didn't really have a strong ideology either way, but or training or yeah or anything. Or it was like yeah. yeah, it was just it was it was like I think it was like it was like a few dozen it was a few dozen like local guys from a rural area that were more concerned with like kicking the regime out of um, their neighborhood. Because at this point, the regime is fragmenting. It's got one guy sitting in a in a in a police in a police box feeling frightened. Other places, a huge barracks outside Aleppo or Palmyra, and and the whole thing is in flux, and everyone yeah. is in danger, and every community is out for itself. Exactly, exactly. And um, at this time, like in, in Raqqa, um, you know, people were being arrested and being tortured, you know, sometimes being tortured to death, which, is, you know, happened all over the country. And at what point does ISIS turn up in this story? ISIS um, turns up in uh, 2013. It turns up after um, the rebels kick the government out of Raqqa. And um, at that time, um, ISIS splits off from the local Al-Qaeda affiliate, which was called uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, or not splits off, there's a very convoluted story about how these two broke up that I won't bore you with, but it, essentially it, it was not about ideology so much as... Um, authority. Yeah, authority. Yeah. And um, ISIS um, kicked out all of the other rebel groups from Raqqa, which at this point were mostly um, Islamist groups, um, and it, um, it took over the city and immediately began to impose uh, its rule on the city. Um, everything from, you know, the very famous uh, bla all black, you know, including like black gauze over the eyes and black gloves for women. Um, Yezidi sex slaves being brought in from the uh, yes. periphery and sold in, in yes. slave markets. Yes, exactly. And he's been witnessing all this stuff. Well, I mean, he didn't know? witness this, this. There was never like public slave markets that a civilian, you know, would see in Raqqa. I mean, these were things that were not for civilians. Um, in terms of how ISIS de dealt with civilians, this is actually something very important. ISIS referred to them as commoners, and they, oh, really? um, yeah. in general, viewed Rockins as sinful and corrupt people um, who were not to be trusted, and who ISIS, in its benevolent charity, was redeeming. Um, the way that ISIS would speak, it mirrors the way that European these colonists... Were not these were not locals? No, they were not locals. These were foreigners, um, many Gulfies, um, many Iraqis, and many Europeans. And um, the discourse of ISIS is almost like a mirror image of the discourse of European colonialism, which is, we're coming here, we're raping local women, we're killing local people, we are um, taking local kids away from their parents and brainwashing them. And we're it's a civilizing mission. Yes, exactly. It was a civilizing mission to restore them to true Islam. That was exactly how they phrased it. And you locals should be grateful to this. And so Marwan is, is part of a, a wide group of local people who are in every way opposed to what's going on around him. I mean, I don't, th I think most, the vast majority of Rockins wanted, like the vast majority of everyone everywhere wanted to live and did not want um, a crazed death cult running things. Um, I think that some people in Raqqa, certainly not Marwan whatsoever, obviously, but some people in Raqqa at first thought that ISIS would uh, bring order and an end to like, you know, the looting and the kidnapping. Um, but... Very soon, they became a population of people that were under a brutal military occupation that strung up bodies in the main square. And um, it's interesting. America destroyed Raqqa. Um, it destroyed Raqqa last year. It killed thousands of civilians. And it um, destroyed 80% of the city. And the local population was stopped leaving. By they, were stopped, they had been by stopped ISIS. leaving. Yeah. The, the ISIS had mined the borders of the city and was executing people who left. And also, a lot of people can't leave. Like, it's very hard, for instance, if you have five young children, right, or an elderly um, parent who can't walk to uh, leave some place that where it involves you, like fucking, you know, fording a, um, a river, a, a, yeah. A, a, or, yeah, or, or, or going over a landmine. Yeah, yeah or going yeah. over a minefield. So, because of this conflation of the civilian population with ISIS, no one in America protested when America destroyed Raqqa and when America killed thousands of civilians that are buried in mass graves and that it still refuses to acknowledge. And no one protested when they destroyed Mosul either, which was also occupied by ISIS. And so um, I always think it's very important to draw a line between 
a civilian population and a military that's occupying and, and them. Is Marwan at this point in Istanbul? He's got out, or, or yeah, he's he, Marwan is Marwan um, had gotten out um, at right. I think Amer America had already been bombing, had been bombing, but um, he got out in uh, January 2016 at... Um, at the very last moment? I mean, if he hadn't made it out then, would he have, would he have been stuck in there for the bombing? Would he prob probably, yeah. probably, yeah. And, um, and just to get the importance of this, how many other young men in Raqqa are able, have found a way to get their views out to the outside world? I mean, is this virtually the only detailed first-person report coming out of ISIS-occupied Raqqa? So there was a, a very famous collective uh, that was called Raqqa is being silently slaughtered. Uh, most of the uh, members of it had left relatively early because it became so dangerous for them, but they still had sources inside. Uh, ISIS targeted them. They beheaded their and shot their members on video. They even hunted their members in, and beheaded them in Turkey. Um, oh, really? In, in Istanbul? Yeah, yeah. In, in, it wasn't in Istanbul, it was, I forget, I think so it might have been in Gaziantep. Um, but one of, their member, one of their members was beheaded uh, in, inside Turkey. Um, and there were other groups as well that uh, got stuff out, um, sometimes more in Arabic than in English. But um, the reason I, uh, I cherish Marwan's perspective is Marwan, in my opinion, is... Um, the only person who not just like got out news of Raqqa, but is a literary writer, right, you know? Right. And that's something fundamentally different. You, you said, told me on, in the car here that he translated Waiting for Godot into Arabic. In, in yeah, he did <laughs> during university. Like I was- I, there, are not, there are not many of those in Raqqa. For <laughs> I mean, th that and he's also, I think, probably the only person who lived under ISIS and read The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> right. <laughs> We've run out of time, but just, so, just, so this book is recently out, came out in May. How, how do you trump this? This is a, oh, that's the wrong word now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, so this book, um, I'm, I'm just going to be uh, vain because I, I just got this news a few days ago. For, Sorry, so yes, forgive I, me. I, I, this is my job to announce it. Forgive me, I failed to. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, give a big round of applause for this book. It's now on the National Book Award shortlist. Uh, long list, yeah. Long list. <laughs> So how on earth do you top this now? I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm, <laughs> I'm doing next. I'm a burnt out shell of a human. I don't know. Maybe I just, I just uh, drink and read Arabic literature. Great. <laughs> Big round of applause, please, for Molly Crabber. Um, we would like to open it up for questions at this point. So if you would like to raise your hand, we'll get the microphone to you. Gentleman in the front row here. In your view, was there ever a anti-Assad group worth supporting? And do, what do you think Obama's policy should have been in Syria? So by anti-Assad group, I mean, there's two uh, dimensions to that. Do you, I assume you're asking me about an armed group, right? Um, not a group of activists, you know. Um, there are many, many groups of activists worth supporting. Um, you know, there, I think that the Farouk brigades at the very beginning um, were worth supporting. I think that um, the problem was that the primary funders of these brigades, right, were Saudi and Qatar. And um, neither of these countries are countries known for um, democratic, secular, and free-thinking ideals. And they also um, fought their own little proxy war by funding different groups against each other um, to mess with each other. So I think that... Um, from the start, groups that were secular um, were, they had no money, you know, and groups that were Islamists were flooded with money. So I think that that has a lot to do with um, why the armed anti-Assad movement turned out the way that it did. Um, there are many other reasons, but I think uh, funding is uh, one of the largest ones. Um, another thing was that um, Assad made areas that were not under his control entirely unlivable by uh, doing uh, bombing campaigns that targeted um, markets and hospitals and schools. So um, it wasn't like you could have like a, th it was very, very hard to have a thriving civilian life in these areas because they were just being bombed and besieged and even gassed. Um, in terms of Obama's policy, um, I, I sometimes try to avoid um, speaking about this. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not a military strategist, right? I'm an artist, but I think that the one thing I would say with certainty is that Obama making that red line speech and um, then not enforcing it 
um, was viewed as a profound act of betrayal. And I know that because, I mean, I went to camps, you know, inside Lebanon afterwards, and I spoke to people, and they told me that. Um, so I think that the um, Obama policy of um, saying one thing, giving out little trickles of weapons that you know, weren't enough to actually change anything but could prolong things a bit to try to get influence, um, trying to sort of shape what different groups did, and um, yeah, making a bunch of um, bullshit promises. I think that that was an incredibly cruel policy. Um, and uh, then when Obama and later Trump uh, started the anti-ISIS campaign, uh, they did it with a complete disregard for civilian casualties because they wanted to, especially Trump, he wanted to uh, win fast so that he could look good. And uh, because of that, many, many, many thousands of civilians were, were killed. And uh, two old, old, ancient cities full of history and heritage in the Middle East were entirely leveled. But again, to make the counter argument, what else could you do? ISIS was an existential threat to the whole region. Well, uh, um, you could have done it slower. That's one thing. Um, you could have used a house more. by house. Yeah, um, exactly. Exactly. As opposed to just carpet bombing. I mean, I think that's one thing. Um, you you could have um, given them the option to leave um, from the start, as opposed but to the house by house thing. Also happened. Didn't it? I mean, there was a, a, a the recapture in, 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 of in, 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 yeah. in Mosul. In Mosul. Um, the thing in Raqqa that was so disgusting was that they destroyed the city, and then they let the ISIS fighters leave afterwards. Why? How? Yeah, they let the... Because they didn't want to, you know... You, you didn't know this? That they Tell let, me this? Yeah. That they let the ISIS fighters... Evacu they let ISIS fighters evacuate Raqqa after the city was destroyed to avoid a final confrontation. So I think that if their plan was to allow ISIS fighters to evacuate, perhaps they didn't have to, you know, kill quite so many civilians beforehand. And was that with the notion of, of saving the civilians? Or no, they had already destroyed the city. It was with the notion of not um, losing too many of the troops that they were, of the um, SDF members that they were supporting. I, and, and so the, the ISIS fighters literally just packed up bags and, and are now defused? Exactly, around, okay. exactly. I mean, many were caught too in the campaign, but um, ISIS fighters were allowed to uh, leave at the end. And I, I think that it's disgusting that that happened um, after the whole city was destroyed. I didn't know that. Any more? Uh, Gentlemen with the glasses. Please stand, sir. I have some difficulty in standing up. Can I? No, no. Don't worry. Sit. Yeah, very, very fascinating description you gave. I wonder, with all your experience of diverse viewpoints, do you? What is the cause and what is the effect? The violence is that the effect of uh, religious intolerance, or the religious intolerance is the effect of all the violence? I mean, it's kind of a chicken and egg type thing, right? Um, you know, injustice and uh, oppression radicalizes people, and not just religiously. It, you know, it. I mean, the uh, how should we put this? The economic collapse of Weimar Berlin definitely, uh, you know, at post Versailles Treaty, definitely led many people to be susceptible to Nazism, um, but also ideologies like um, this sort of religious fascism of a group like ISIS or the secular fascism of other groups also, um, you know, murder countless people and then radicalize others. I think that this is um, just a, it's a cycle, you know, in, in human history, um, the, the interplay between oppression and um, violent ideologies. I feel that very strongly when you go to Israel. Um, and, there's, and everyone in that conflict has been brutalized. And, and, and coming particularly for traveling in the Middle East, you come from the other countries, the region where hospitality and politeness, uh, whatever else goes on, you know, the, the politeness is still very, very important. And you arrive there and everyone is rude. <laughs> and everyone is brutalized from some, some of the various traumas which have rattled those countries. It feels very strong. Other Any questions? Others? Front row. Uh, is Manu at risk where he is in Istanbul uh, as a consequence of this book? Uh, Marwan? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't say his name correctly. Please forgive me. Um, I, don't, I don't think as a consequence of this book, no. But I want to um, just bring up something. Um, Turkey uh, right now, um, unfortunately, um, so Turkey on one hand, it has three million Syrian refugees and it has to have a huge amount of credit for um, having taken so many refugees. But um, there's a lot of uh, racism right now in Turkey. Um, there's a lot of instances, for instance, of uh, 
you know, groups of Turks uh, beating and smashing up and burning stuff in Syrian neighborhoods on accusations that a Syrian gr guy looked at a Turkish girl, for instance. And um, the opposition parties um, to Erdogan uh, both ran on uh, anti-Syrian platforms. Um, Erdogan himself is um, an extraordinarily authoritarian uh, leader that um, is verging on being a dictator and has locked up, you know, tens of thousands, tens of, thousands of, of people in jail, including um, probably lawyers. the head of the best opposition party, uh, the HDP. But um, the other two opposition parties uh, do run on uh, platforms that have racism at their base. One more question before we close yes, it. Yes, the gentleman over there. You want to run this over to him? Yeah, sir. Yeah, over on yep. that side. Could you say a little bit if you have had any experience with the Kurdish groups in Syria and Raqqa? And in particular, I'm curious to know whether the fact that women play a more important role in some of the mm -hmm. Kurdish groups, whether that's had an effect on any of the phenomena you're talking about. So um, I, uh, I did not cover um, from inside Kurdish, er Kurdish areas. Um, I did one piece about um, Afrin after it was um, brutally invaded by the Turks. I had um, a source inside there talking about the, um, really the war crimes being done by uh, Turkish-backed proxy groups there. Um, I think the fact that for whatever else one can criticize um, the PYD on, and there's much to criticize, they're extraordinarily committed to women's equality and um, the commitment to integrating half of the population um, into um, the leadership and um, the running of their areas is something incredibly commendable and um, something incredibly admirable. Um, one question for me, just looking through this book, I mean, it's very dark. How was it, I mean, I can see all sorts of aspects of this are exciting and fun. You go to Istanbul, Marwan's an amazing guy, uh, these are extraordinary stories, but every day you're waking up, you're painting pictures of crucifixions, of people being lynched, of, of, of Islamists. Did, it, did living with this for three, four years, the darkness of Raqqa, did that, was that a horrible thing to wake up to every morning, to know that rather than painting pictures of burlesque or, uh, or, or fun stuff, that you actually had to paint a picture of someone being crucified that morning? How was that? Oh, it's, it's horrible. I mean, um, you know, I, um, I always feel a bit stupid uh, talking about like my own uh, trauma, such as it may be, uh, because I, ultimately it's my choice, right? I'm not uh, someone who is living in Syria and not allowed to leave because of the passport I hold. You know, um, and I think that that trauma in many ways is um, more of a valid thing to focus on. Uh, but yes, it is very, very difficult to uh, repeatedly watch uh, videos of people being tortured uh, and then freeze frame them over and over again to try to get a good shot that you can draw from. And so, and, and how did you, I mean, so you're in Istanbul and you're having to do this. Do you, I mean, do you kind of go off and get drunk in the evening or, I mean, it, the actual process of writing a book that's incredibly depressing about torture, crucifixion, oppression, well, so day I, after I, day. I, I want to um, just say something that, it is um, a dark book, obviously. There's no way to write this, but it's also a book about resilient, cynical, witty people um, who are tougher than probably most of us in this room and who um, were determined to get joy out of their lives, you know, even in the most horrific circumstances. Uh, so it's not just like, you know, some sort of torture porn chronicle, right? Or like some story about sad people. I don't really... I'm not really interested in stories that are just about like one-dimensional sad people. Um, but the way that we would write it was, uh, it started with notes that Marwan had written when he was in Raqqa, uh, that he had intended to write a book, but he was, wasn't sure, you know, thought maybe when he was an old man. And he, we started with these notes. I would um, interview him and I would write stuff that would fill in the notes and then he would write more, you know, based on those. And um, then he'd read what I wrote and he would be like, this is terrible, you know, no, no, no. Like, why are you writing so simplistically? Like, don't you have, you know, I, I, I translated Waiting for, go for God, oh, God damn it. And you're going to write in these like basic bitch sentences? What the hell, you know? And I was like, Marwan, you know, your stuff's really good, but uh, Americans don't know anything about Islam and you're going to have to explain like a little bit more for them or else they're all going to get lost. Um, and I, I want to just make a note. 
some of the best reviews that we've had and some of the best support we've had for this book has been from India and from um, you know, outlets uh, like uh, The Wire, uh, for instance. And I've often thought that part of why uh, they were so much better than um, many American reviewers was that there wasn't this um, entitlement that comes from being the global hegemon where you expect every single thing to be put mm. in terms of you. you know, I felt that Indian reviewers um, both were more worldly but also more able to take things on their own terms as opposed to Americans who were like, what is a Shia? What is a Sunni? Is it like a Catholic did and a get, Protestant? Did, did you get, you got criticized in reviews for not explaining more? Yeah, no. yeah. Arundhati Roy, very interestingly, in, in, uh, uh, when she was being interviewed about God of Small Things, you should say, was, again, it was criticized for, for not explaining Syrian, Christian, Kerala and stuff to a global audience. So she says, as soon as Updike explains to me what's happening in any of those baseball scenes, <laughs> I'll explain what's happening in, 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 in when I'm describing someone making a Syrian Christian meal. But <laughs> Exactly. I mean, my one pointed that out with my book. Like I had, he, he was like going through one chapter and he's like, what is a go-go dancer? What's a dive bar? What do you mean CBGBs? And I was like, ah, it's way more parochial than I, I'm way more parochial than I thought I am. You know, I'm using like local jargon and I didn't even think about it. But yeah, that's what comes from being in like the global hegemony. You don't, you don't think. Ladies and gentlemen, this book is for sale. Molly Crabapple will be signing copies. Go out and buy a copy before it wins the, the National Book Award. Get it signed and it'll become a historic collector's item. Thank you yeah. so much. And thank you so much, <laughs> Willie.